Hello friends, and welcome back to Strange. A few months ago, I did this video about old YouTube viral videos and you guys really, really enjoyed it. And considering that I had only scratched the surface of old YouTube viral videos in that video, I decided a part two seemed necessary. This time I also asked you guys for suggestions of old viral videos that you remember fondly or terribly, both work. And everybody responded like, oh, you have to do Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, do actual Cannibal Shia LaBeouf. Oh, what about Rebecca Black's Friday? You fools, you utter, Imbeciles. Those are all post 2010. Those I don't think count as like early YouTube viral videos. They are spectacular videos though. And, and really what this has proven to me is that I also need to do a 2010s viral videos video. So that that's for sure going to be the next one. My hypothesis right now is that the 2010s ones are going to be better, just a higher quality of videos because the early, early viral videos were, were coming into a world where viral videos didn't exist yet, where the internet was just this like haha funny little place where you'd post stuff and expect like 20 people to see it. Most of these early viral videos are either bad, good because they're bad, or just genius in their, in their simplicity. Except for shoes and chocolate rain. Those two go so unnecessarily hard for like 2006, 2007. I covered those two in the last video. I feel like the last video really knocked off a lot of the like most iconic old viral videos ever. These, This video we might devolve into a few that are, are maybe a little bit more obscure. I mean, obscure for viral video standards. The whole point is that they're viral, but anyway. Let me take you once again on a journey through time, my friends. Before social media, before influencers, before videos with millions of views were commonplace and memes evolved by the week. Back in the day, if you got millions of views on a YouTube video, people were like, whoa, that's pretty crazy. That's, that's impressive. That's wild. That's spectacular. Never been done before. What kind of a witchcraft is this? Society was very, very impressed. <laughs> By some, by some very simple videos. But before we get into that, I have a few fun little things to tell you about. First of all, I have a new Patreon perk. If you sign up for the $10 tier of my Patreon, you can get two free stickers from this very funky selection. Yes, I will personally mail them to your location addressed in my horrible toddler handwriting. I'm not selling these stickers anywhere else, so this is the only way to get them. Quick Patreon recap, actually. The $2 tier gets you access to my patrons-only Discord server where I do live streams every single week, answering your questions, looking at your stupid memes, playing Jackbox games, and... and whatnot with my audience. $5 tier gets you access to that Discord server as well as your name and all of the credits of my videos. $10 tier, all of the above, plus two stickers. Link will be below if you want to support me on Patreon. And now a little bit about this video sponsor, Audible. I really love audiobooks. I listen to them constantly. I find it to be a super helpful way to, to fit books into my chaotic life. And Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre. Whatever it is that you're into, they're going to have something for you. For me, I listen to a lot of queer science fiction and fantasy books. My highest recommendation will always be the Locked Tomb series. The first book is Gideon the Ninth. The audiobooks for all of them are amazing. I love the voices that the narrator does. She gets quite creative with some of them, and they're just they're just really well done audiobooks for a really amazing series. I've I've read them as books, I've listened to them as audiobooks. It's even fun to compare those experiences. And when you become an Audible member, you can choose any audiobook from their selection to get for free. You'll continue to get a free audiobook every single month that you're a member. And those books will be yours to keep forever, even if you end up canceling your Audible membership down the line. Plus, all Audible members now have access to a growing selection of titles, all included within the membership. That includes all kinds of audiobooks, podcasts, Audible originals, even guided fitness and meditation programs and sleep tracts. They got all kinds of stuff and more is being added all the time. To try out Audible for 30 days for free, you can head on over to audible.com slash strangeons or text strangeons to 500-500. Remember to go check it out. And now I return to your regularly scheduled content. Cats, I'm a kitty cat. And I dance, 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 and I dance, dance, dance. Cats, I'm a kitty cat. And I dance, 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 and I dance, dance, dance. Cats, I'm a kitty cat. Kitty Cat Dance was created by digital artist Steve Ibsen in 2004 when he was only 17 years old. He was taking pictures of his cat, Kayla, as one does. And he noticed that when he scrolled through the photos, it looked like a stop motion animation of the cat dancing. So he made that. I love this video. I love this video. Whenever people say things to me, they, they say things to me of along the lines of, oh, you're, you're, you're an introvert, you're difficult to read, I, I don't know what you're thinking right now. This is it. This is what's playing in my brain on a loop. It's just like one of those primal 2000s internet cat videos that is just like, yes, I can feel it. The year is 2009 and I am 
logging into my Hotmail account in the school computer lab to email this to my friends. Subject line, very important. He first uploaded the video just to like his own website, but it actually managed to gain a, a decent amount of popularity, a decent amount of views that way, and was quickly picked up by larger video sharing websites like Newgrounds. The first few videos that I'm going to talk about here, so I'm doing it chronologically, so the first videos that I'm talking about and the oldest videos that I'm talking about here, most of them originated on sites other than YouTube, specifically Newgrounds. A lot of them became popular on Newgrounds before YouTube was even created. YouTube came onto the scene in 2005. And I think there's a handful of these that were on Newgrounds in 2004, um, such as the kitty cat dance. Newgrounds was essentially just like the closest equivalent to YouTube before YouTube, the most popular video site before YouTube. And around 2005, 2006, it really started to blur quite a bit with YouTube. Things would be re-uploaded from Newgrounds to YouTube, gained whole new audiences and whole new meme potentials um, because of YouTube and because of the very fast growing popularity of YouTube. It, YouTube very quickly surpassed anything else as like the video sharing giant. After 2005, 2006, you don't really see anything being uploaded anywhere but YouTube. But there was this gray area, like 2005, 2006, where a lot of Newgrounds videos ended up on YouTube and the, the line is kind of muddled. So I'm including some videos on this list as YouTube viral videos that technically predate YouTube. I'm including them if I think that YouTube played an interesting enough role in, in the popularity or the, the story of that video. Anyway, we're talking about the kitty cat dance. Very heavy, important uh, subject matter that requires many disclaimers. We're talking <laughs> the kitty cat dance. It was uploaded to YouTube in 2005, not by the original creator. The person who uploaded it first actually managed to monetize like millions of views on this video until Steve Ibsen, the original creator, reached out to YouTube and was able to prove to them that the vid video was originally his. Even though at that point, the other one, again, had been up, up for like seven years, millions of views that were monetized um, and was like largely considered to be the original. It wasn't. What made the Kitty Cat Hands video so popular is not just that the original is, is so delightful, uh, but that the song is so catchy and so easily memed. People used it in, in all kinds of videos of their own, edits of their own. A lot of anime cat girls. It's the internet, man. In 2021, Ibsen announced that he would be selling the kitty cat dance as an NFT. I know, the first one down the list and we're already one for one on NFTs. I'm sorry. <laughs> However, I do find his story and his reasoning fascinating because it's one that we actually have not heard before, despite how many viral videos surprisingly have been sold as NFTs. At the time that he made and posted the video, like 2004, nobody expected to make any money off of internet content. And despite the extreme popularity of the video, Ibsen remained a struggling art student throughout most of its popularity. Meanwhile, though, you have Hot Topic selling merch of his cat, which he never consented to, like never mind got any money from. That's just insane. He also explains that his song has been used in Roblox and there's like, in Fortnite, there's like a weird, obvious ripoff version of it. So like, at least they pretended to care about stealing his work. And in this very copyright violation sensitive YouTube climate that we're in now, it's almost like hard to comprehend. The video and the song have been stolen from him blatantly so many times. And on one hand, it's like, bro, it's impossible to own a meme though. You can't do it and you shouldn't try. Cause like the whole fun of it is that it's the internet and it's a free-for-all and anyone can use it. And like, that's how it becomes a meme in the first place. However, when you have examples like Roblox using it, like Hot Topic selling merch of it, these, these are huge successful companies just blatantly ripping off a small creator. And that's absolutely a problem. That, that's not the same as just other internet users making parodies of it. For Ibsen, the biggest appeal of making the kitty cat dance into an NFT was to have this definitive original with his name attached to it out in the world. Just because he's been through so much frustration over the video being stolen from him, being attributed to other people, and you know, he doesn't say it, but I'm sure being able to finally make some money off of this thing when other people are clearly making money off of this thing is, is also a perk. <laughs> Numa Numa Dance was first posted to Newgrounds in 2004 by 19-year-old Gary Brolsma. The song he's dancing to is by a Moldovan pop group called Ozone. The language the song is sung in is a variety of Romanian spoken in Moldova. It just so happens that the words Numa Numa sound very funny to an English speaking ear. Gary has said that he found out about the song, first heard the song uh, through another video that he saw on Newgrounds. It was a cat video, because of course it was a cat video. And the song got stuck in his head and he just 
did this when he posted it to Newgrounds. It just immediately blew up on there. People loved it. It just, it just has a good vibe. It's just, he's just a guy having fun, doing his thing, not really caring what anyone thinks. In a 2014 interview, he said, a couple of days after I posted the video, I was asleep when my mom woke me up. News vans from CBC, NBC, ABC were parked outside of our house. I hadn't told her what I did and I think she thought I had gotten in trouble. She didn't know what I did at first, but then I finally showed her. <laughs> and she just called me a goofball. It's hard to say how many views that it got in total because there were so many versions of it. This was kind of like the weird phase between YouTube and Newgrounds. So you had versions of it on Newgrounds and other similar smaller video websites and then you had versions of it on YouTube and all of these versions had, had many millions of views. In 2006, so when the video had actually only existed for two years, the BBC used page impressions data to estimate that the total views was something like 700 million? Like that's insane. That made it the second highest viewed internet video of all time at that point. Second only to Star Wars Kid, the video I mentioned, which I, th I think is a bit too old to qualify for this video. It, it was posted in like 2002 and all of the, the drama and followed around it went down like, before YouTube ever existed. So, but yeah, in 2006, highest viewed videos ever were apparently Star Wars Kid and then the Numa Numa dance. So what about the creator of the video, Gary? How did he, how did he handle this, this unprecedented fame when, when the, all of the news trucks started showing up to his mother's house? He reached a point a couple months into all of it where he just, he canceled all of his public appearances and kind of just hid from the internet for a little while. He, he needed a break from it. It became too much, uh, which is very, very understandable. Over 10 million views later, Gary was caught off guard by the Numa Numa explosion. All of a sudden I've had media at the door, uh, news reporters knocking down the door. Uh, so after a while, it got just a little overwhelming. I was always shy and quiet, so and I decided to like, you know, sit back and like, just take a break from everything. And he did eventually come back. In 2006, he released New Numa, a sequel to the Numa Numa dance featuring a song, New Numa, which was made specifically for him, as well as a music video, which was quite an up in production value from the webcam. He also announced the New Numa contest where he challenged his viewers to submit their own videos to the New Numa song. There were a few winners who all got different amounts of prize money, but this stop motion animation by user Teeth3D was the top winner. He won $25,000 for this, so good on him. And all of this seems to have been received pretty well by the internet. And honestly, I'm so glad. I'm so, I'm so glad that he was not relentlessly bullied because we have so, so many examples of people being vulnerable, showing their authentic selves on the internet in the 2000s that did not go nearly as well for people. He did a few other videos over the years. One that I find particularly weird and interesting is this ad for Geico insurance that he did in 2009. It's almost like an exact replica of the original Numa Numa dance video, but it's a different song and the Geico gecko was there. Hey, if, if any of us were in his situation, we can't say what weird shit we would do for money. In 2014, so 10 years after he made the original video, he said in an interview that his life wasn't really changed by Numa Numa fame in the long term, that it eventually died down and now he's just, he's just a guy. Later that same year on the exact 10 year anniversary of the video, he posted a video entitled Numa Numa 10 Year Reunion where he lip syncs to various popular songs. But even that was a long time ago. Like we're approaching the 20 year anniversary of this video, so. It's been a minute since Gary has talked publicly or, or done anything. He's, as far as I know, he's just a guy. He's out there being a guy. Evolution of Dance features public speaker and comedian Judson Lapley dancing to short snippets of 32 songs throughout history, which have featured iconic dances. It's one of those videos that was on like that top of all time, most viewed li videos list for a while. I know it was it was always like a couple videos underneath uh, Charlie Bit My Finger. It's so ugly and crunchy. Like, you can't even see his facial features. You can't see shit. Like what is this? And yet it is somehow also still so iconic looking. Like you see this screen cap and you know immediately with the man standing in the spotlight, you know immediately that that's evolution of dance. It's simple yet clever. It has just like the most mass appeal ever. One article says, it's the sort of video even your tech illiterate grandparents would have seen. And they did. They did, well, not my grandparents, they're dead. But maybe your tech illiterate grandparents saw it. The video was actually filmed in 2001, but was not uploaded to YouTube until 2006. Lapley says that he chose YouTube to upload the video simply because it was the most user-friendly of the video sites and it made it super easy to share. He's like a public speaker, motivational speaker, comedian kind of guy. And the whole evolution of dance routine was developed as a part of his show. Just from skimming his website a bit, it seems like his whole 
sort of thing, his, his, his thing that he wants to inspire people about uh, in his speeches is that change is good. Embrace change in your life or career or whatever. So this, Evolution of Dance, was his way of kind of making that message fun and engaging for his audience. That's it. That's the reason for Evolution of Dance. I feel like so many of these viral videos have just kind of like wacky, weird, kind of chaotic origin stories. Like, so there was this guy and he was taking photos of his cat and, you know, last week he heard this Romanian pop song. I don't know, these happy accidents happen sometimes. But not this one, no. This one has a very simple and rational explanation for why it exists. Lapley has said that having this viral video has absolutely helped his career. He still performs the dance to this day. He has absolutely no problem being called the, the evolution of dance guy. In fact, his website really wants you to know. World's first YouTube celebrity, book him for a motivational speech at your company. I find it interesting how this is one video that's not particularly easy to like meme or parody. People have done it, but generally people with a lot of time and budget to spare. Ring, 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 banana phone. Banana phone was originally posted to Newgrounds in 2004. It was created by users Dave Teatro and Lazy Will. It features the song Banana Phone, all one word, Banana Phone, released in 1994 by an artist called Raffi who made music for children. It's full of many delightful banana puns and it's illegally catchy. So the plot of this viral video is basically the blonde guy wakes up one day hearing the song. He's like, lol what? Okay, banana phone. He goes to tell his roommates to turn down this funky new music and they're like, what music? The music is coming from inside of his brain and it is getting slowly louder. What a genuinely horrifying premise, okay. Blonde guy slowly loses his mind, creeping out his roommates until one of them knocks him out with a remote. That's what this moment is supposed to be? I, I thought he just straight up died. <laughs> Excellent animation, guys. The roommates start arguing until they realize that the song has jumped to them now. This is the video that is apparently the most recognizable as like the origin of the song Banana Phone as a meme. However, there's another video even older referred to as Osaka Phone. It was posted on a site called Apple Geeks in 2004. Here is the thing though. I have never seen either of these videos in my entire life. Things got kind of weird when I was looking into this one because a lot of people suggested that I, I do Banana Phone and I was like, of course, Banana phone. Ring, 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 ring. Banana phone. We've all heard it. But apparently, I've never seen the banana phone viral video. What I discovered is that it's better described as like a meme than a viral video. But but also, what do I mean by that? Because I've also said that meme viral that viral videos are memes, and they are. So I guess what I'm trying to explain is that some okay some memes such as most viral videos, are like, hey, look at this funny thing. Observe this haha -ha image. But then there are some memes that are more like trends. It becomes really, really hard to, to ever trace it back to, to one thing. It's just this picture or this audio or this whatever that just seems to be reused constantly in jokes online all of a sudden. Banana Phone is much more like that. There's thousands of videos out there that use the song. So I'm gonna be real. I don't know if this counts as like a vir viral video in the same sense as the other ones because it doesn't feel like something that is like centralized around one video. It's more of the trend variety of memes, something that a lot, a lot of people jumped on because the song was funny. Before it was making videos about Onision drama, this was how you got views on YouTube. <laughs> Do you understand? And yet, this song has been stuck in my head for 15 years, so I need to talk about it. The version that I remember watching as a kid was like, it was okay. It was like a bad PowerPoint to the song with like stock photo -y images. However, there is another version that I found that um really yeeted my ass back to 2008 that I also definitely watched. It's the Potter Puppet Pals version. Banana phone. Interestingly, the oldest upload of the the original Banana Phone Flash video on YouTube has 900,000 views. Whereas the Potter Puppet Pals version has 1.5 million views. And there are others that also have multiple millions of views. So the original version from Newgrounds is probably not the most viral version on YouTube. Yet again, proving that the phenomenon of Banana Phone is, is not really an example of a, a YouTube viral video, but like a meme trend thing that started on Newgrounds and then infected YouTube, whatever. I'm including this because it's an interesting study in how we don't 
we don't always remember viral videos the way that they actually are, or we don't. Anyway, I feel like I'm having a, what, what was it called? I feel like I'm having a Mandela effect moment. Anyway, apparently TikTok is bringing this song back now. Yeah, that feels fitting. Congratulations, Raffi. You created something truly timeless. Hello. I like rusty spoons. <laughs> I like to touch them. <laughs> salad Fingers is an animated video which introduces us to this messed up little salad fingered man. I always assumed he was some kind of a mutant living in an apocalyptic setting. He loves to touch rusty spoons. He speaks in this really creepy soft voice. Really everything about the video is designed to be kinda unsettling. It's the first in a series which chronicles Salad Fingers' adventures throughout this always dark and gross world that he lives in, his interactions with the other inhabitants, and even the workings of his twisted mind. The early episodes I find though are especially creepy. There's something cleaner about the later ones which just takes away from it in my opinion. The first seven episodes of Salad Fingers were posted to Newgrounds between 2004 and 2007, and then 2006 apparently according to my notes. And then they made the jump to YouTube in 2007 and the series continued from there. They were created by filmmaker David Firth. Salad Fingers was his gateway into sort of accidentally becoming an animator. He says that the name Salad Fingers comes from like just a comment that his friend made about the way that he played guitar. So it has absolutely nothing to do with what, what became Salad Fingers. He does the voice of Salad Fingers himself and he describes the voice as like a combination of his grandmother and Michael Jackson which is so specific. The fact that Salad Fingers has this kind of whispery asmr -y voice is because he made the first couple of episodes while living with his parents. He was recording at night and he didn't want to wake them up, so he whispered. Apparently the original Salad Fingers video took him only 24 hours to make. However, as it became a series, the, late, the later ones ended up being a lot more elaborate and time consuming. There are currently 12 episodes of Salad Fingers and it's still going indefinitely. Firth has said that he has a lot of different projects ongoing and Salad Fingers is something that he always wants to, to come back to and is, is keeping it going, but it's episodes are few and far between just because he doesn't have a lot of time to work on it. I would definitely have to describe the Salad Fingers fan base as like a, a cult following. Obviously many millions of people have seen the first episode for the, the creepy, quirky shock value of it, but there's very much a subset of people who think it goes much deeper than that. Salad Fingers has been subject to many fan theories, close analyses. It's apparently been featured in some short film festivals. There was supposed to be a 2020 Salad Fingers UK tour. It ended up being canceled due to COVID or postponed due to COVID. It did eventually happen. Uh, and these screenings were essentially of, of all 12 episodes of Salad Fingers back to back. And then there would be in-person interviews with Firth. So yeah, people really like this thing and hold it up as art TM. And like, yeah. It's, it's good. If you have sensitivities around gore or self-harm, I would definitely not recommend it. But I also think it's not tasteless. Ah oh, yes, of course, you know that the tasteful episode of Salad Fingers where he has a romance with a rotting dog corpse. This is what I mean. It's it's the sort of thing that, that attracts the, the cult following rather than the, the mass appeal. It's not something that you just recommend to people without any sort of disclaimers. I know back in the day it really resonated with the, the emo scene kind of people. For starters, there was the edginess. There was the, the aesthetic of it, which was, according to Firth himself, kind of Tim Burton inspired. But emos love that stuff. You show them a weird little green guy and some fucked up trees, hell yeah. I vividly remember being shown Salad Fingers for the first time uh, by the, the most emo, the most senior emo member of my middle school friend group. Um, I think we, I remember watching it in class. I think we were supposed to be doing homework or something and we were just watching Salad Fingers. I'm Fred. And, Mom, I'm not using your camera! Um, I can't go trick-or-treating even as it's Halloween because my mom, um, she went out with some friends to a Halloween party and she left me home alone and she said I can't leave the house. Fred on Halloween was posted on October 31st, 2006. It features 13-year-old Lucas Cruikshank vlogging as a character who he called Fred. His voice is edited to be very fast and high-pitched. The character of Fred is supposed to be a hyperactive six-year-old child, so there's a lot of rambling and singing and screaming. It's, it's like instant headache in a video. Lucas ended up making multiple videos in the character of Fred and 
they got views. The first few Fred videos were uploaded between 2006 and 2008, and they were put on a channel that Lucas had apparently started with his cousins, and, and they posted all kinds of things on there. Fred was one of many characters that he tried out. However, after the Fred videos specifically started getting views, Lucas moved them over to a different channel that was like the dedicated Fred channel. He re-uploaded all of the Fred videos there and, and made it an ongoing series. So if you scroll all the way back to the beginning of the Fred channel, the earliest videos show up as being from 2008, but that is not true. They are actually from 2006, but were re-uploaded in 2008. And that is the case for Fred on Halloween, the first ever Fred video. As the Fred series went on, there was an established cast of characters, there was simple plots, even plot twists, I dare say. The subject matter of the Fred videos was actually quite dark a lot of the time. Fred had some problems. For a child, he was bullied a lot. Things almost never went his way. He had a difficult family life. In 2009, Lucas's Fred channel became the first YouTube channel ever to hit a million subscribers. He was the biggest YouTube celebrity ever at that point. And of course, people absolutely loved to make fun of him. Generally, it was adults who had better things to do. Like, oh my God. I'm pretty, okay, I'm pretty sure that Shane, like one of Shane Dawson's first ever successful videos was a video making fun of Fred. It was, okay, it was called Fred is Dead, and there's a part where he pees in his mouth. There's no way this is still online. There's no way this is still on the internet. Okay, we have, there's a 2021 re-upload. And you know what? I love myself too much to watch it. In a 2008 interview, Lucas Kirkshank described the Fred videos as programming for kids by kids. And I think that really gets to the heart of it. This is somehow like the purest form of kids content, and it could not have happened anywhere but YouTube. And this video is where it started, Fred on Halloween. Interestingly, it actually breaks one of the golden rules of Fred, which is that we never see any other characters except for Fred. Lucas actually briefly also plays Fred's mom in it. So you can tell at that point he was still kind of figuring out the, the formula, the secret formula. He did a reaction video to it a few years ago um, and he talks about like being so impressed by his own editing skills when he made the video and I don't know, I'm su just, I'm surprised by how nostalgic it all makes me. Because I made so many incoherent videos like this as a kid, just like beep booping around on iMovie. Anyway, the, the unprecedented success of Fred meant, of course, that the vultures descended upon him. There were three movies, a TV show, a number of songs. They are all generally considered to be cringe and bad. His appearance on iCarly, I would say is the only one that, that kind of gets a pass. Like it's a little awkward, but it's redeemable. It's the only mainstream media he's done that gets a solid, this is fine rating. These sorts of adaptations obviously age up the character of Fred to match Lucas's actual age. They were also heavily sanitized by, by children's networks because the humor of the Fred videos was actually quite dark. His mother is a recovering alcoholic. His father is in prison. He's bullied relentlessly. He struggles with mental health issues. So just turning him into this kind of like quirky, high pitched, guy is, it doesn't, it's not the same character, you know? We get to see Fred's surroundings, his home, his school, other people, the whole Fred universe is exposed to us under professional film lighting, and it completely wrecks what gave the YouTube series its charm, in my opinion. Obviously, this was never going to be successful with the same audience that loved Fred on YouTube. We don't want to see clean, happy Nickelodeon Fred experience a movie's worth of plot. We want to see Lucas Crookshank put Fred in a stupid little situation and just have it go wrong and Kevin's gonna chase him through a field while he screams and that's it and the whole video is like four minutes. Honestly, if you are able to look past all of the yelling, which I fully understand some people are not, I do think that Fred is an interesting study in character point of view and unreliable narrators because we're experiencing this world through Fred's eyes, through his chaotic vlogs, which are so fragmentary and weird and incomplete and just kind of meant to be dumb and funny, and yet the reality of his life is often very dark. You guys think Salad Fingers is a psychological horror? Okay, I raise you Fred. That's why it always felt kind of clever and self-aware to me. I don't know, I just, media companies really thought they could milk this when they did not understand it at all. Fred could only ever have been Fred on YouTube. I didn't know I had so many opinions about Fred. Apparently I do. Anyway. <laughs> Lucas Crookshank dealt with just an incredible amount of hatred online, and he never publicly engaged with it or, or was publicly upset by it, but I'm glad he seems to have, have got, gotten through it all right. He's still a YouTuber these days. He's done a lot of uh, like 10 years later reactions to, uh, to the old Fred content and stuff, so that's been interesting to watch. Got your nose. <laughs> Look out, he's got a nose. 
Asdif movie is a stick figure animation of a series of short, fast-paced jokes. I thought this was like the funniest thing ever made as a kid. It's somehow formulated to just be crack for the middle schooler's brain. A really good memetic form formula is catchphrase bang. So I like trains bang, hello bang, do the flop bang. They're actually all very similar jokes. Um, no one's noticed yet though, so that's good. I honestly expected this to have aged way worse than it did. I thought it was just gonna be like boring and unfunny and like 2000s edgy in an uncomfortable way. But it's not really, I, I will admit a few of these still do get a chuckle out of me. <laughs> I can't read. As if Movie 1 was posted in 2008, but it very quickly became a series from there. It featured recurring characters, such as the I Like Trains guy. I like trains. And as simple as it is, you watch a few of these videos and you kind of start to feel like you're in on these inside jokes. As if Movie 14 was posted in 2021, I remember a friend sent it to me when it, when it came out. And I watched it and I was like, oh, I feel like it's, it's been so long. I feel like I'm, I'm out of the loop on, on some of these jokes because I haven't seen like the last eight videos in the series at this point. It was also sponsored by a mobile game though. That was, that was a very, ah, uh, this is, we are living in the, the hell times now. This is no longer the old internet. That was, that was that moment for me. The creator of Astiv Movie is a YouTuber called Thomas Ridgewell. He made a video in 2013 explaining kind of the origins of it. He says that the character design goes all the way back to MSN messenger emoticons that he once designed and that the name Asdaf is just a key smash, like, like on the keyboard. As diff. Apparently it had started as a webcomic, but according to Ridgewell himself, the, the comics were, were not very good or funny and they definitely weren't successful online. Some of the jokes from As Diff Movie 1 were taken directly from the comics that came before. And you can see when you compare the original comics to the video how just the, the medium of animation just makes it what it is. It is it simply does not hit on paper. After seeing other kind of simple and stick figure type animations, he decided to maybe do his jokes in that kind of format instead. So Thomas Ridgewell wrote and drew as of movie one, and then it was animated by another YouTuber called James Cunningham, who at the time was 13 years old. And this thing, like, instant millions of views out of nowhere. It was way more successful than anything Ridgewell had made in the past and even more successful than a lot of the animations that had inspired him in the first place. As Just Movie easily launched his career as a YouTuber and he's still going strong both doing animated and live action sketch comedy. He has over 7 million subscribers. There's obviously been tons and tons of merch over the years. Here are the, the 2022 As Just Movie pride designs in case you were wondering. Hey Apple. Hey. Apple. Hey, Apple. Hey, Apple. Apple. Hey. Hey, Apple. What? What? What is it? Orange, you glad I didn't say Apple again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that joke yeah. was funny the first 400 times you said it. The Annoying Orange video is primarily just a conversation between the Annoying Orange, whose job it is to be annoying, and Apple, who is annoyed. And then he gets, like, brutally murdered, and the Orange decides to annoy somebody else now. The video is, get this, annoying. I really don't like it. I, I think it's just annoying. <laughs> it was uploaded to YouTube in 2009 by its creator, Dane Bodekheimer, who goes by the name Dane Bo for obvious reasons. He is an animator and voice actor, and apparently the Annoying Orange was far from his first encounter with talking fruit videos. He had made other talking fruit videos before on his YouTube channel, and for his work as a freelancer, apparently he was already like the talking fruit guy or he was just very, he was familiar with talking fruit content. Weird niche, okay. So he created the Annoying Orange video as like a combination of the talking fruit videos that he was very familiar with, uh, with his own kind of sense of humor. After just four videos, it was such a success that he gave the Annoying Orange its own channel and made it a weekly series. As the series went on, a lot of the humor became centered around like pop culture and current events commentary. It was insanely popular. Every episode got like millions of views. The question is just why? It's not funny. It's literally bad. <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. There are currently 714 episodes of The Annoying Orange and it's still going. There might be 715 by the time this video goes out. In fact, the top comment on the original Annoying Orange video is, can't believe this piece of fruit hasn't decomposed after 11 years. At this point, you can find like any piece of merch, any item imaginable with the Annoying Orange slapped on it. There was a series of comics between 2012 and 2014. There were three games. 
It was adapted by Cartoon Network into a show called The High Fructose Adventures of the Annoying Orange. The show obviously had a much higher production value. It expanded the world building of the original Annoying Orange cinematic universe. They had celebrity guests, apparently. The show was cancelled after two seasons, which is genuinely shocking. Because you would think it wouldn't go past one. Anyway, those, those are all of the, the old viral videos that I felt like either I missed in the first video or you guys really wanted me to talk about after I made the first video. So next time around, we're doing 2010s viral videos. Does anybody remember how animals eat their food? Oh my God, I'm okay. I'm not spoiling anything. I'm, so, I'm genuinely so excited for the next one. Okay. Thank you so much for watching this video, my friends. I will see you. I will, I'll, I'll, I'll be seeing you when you least expect it.